Hey guys, what's up? It's Greg Zavosti with the Find Your Film Podcast. For this episode, I have two interviews with two filmmakers. First up is Kelsey Egan. She is the filmmaker behind The Fix. And then second is Ryan Kruger, the filmmaker behind, I was going to say Fried Berry because I'm such a huge fan of Fried Berry. I'm a huge fan of his latest film as well. It's called Street Trash. So apologize if this intro is a little bit, uh, I don't know if it's lackluster or disorganized. I don't have any kind of notes or Google Doc in front of me. I'm just going off the seat of my shorts right now. So I will say this, both The Fix and Street Trash are very cool films. I enjoy them. I recommend them on digital. They're both available on digital Friday, November 22nd. And there is something called Screenbox as well, which I am... My bad, I am ignorant regarding Screenbox. Screenbox, that will be available for the movie Street Trash. So Street Trash will be on Screenbox and digital on Friday, November 22nd. And then the fix Friday, November 22nd for director Kelsey Egan. Now, what is the fix about? It is a sci-fi thriller. Again, I'm going through my little brain right now. It stars Grace Van Dien. She is a model with a ton of problems because... She has a boyfriend who might, may not be faithful, a best friend who may not be f- loyal. All that said, this is in the future, and she is a little bit, she has a lot of baggage. and Just her past is not, she has things that to reconcile with her past. There are things that she needs to fix with her friends and loved ones. So she comes off at the beginning, and I referred to this in the interview with Kelsey, She comes off as a little bit abrasive and unlikable because she's under a lot of pressure and she's living in this dystopian world where oxygen is at a premium. A lot of things that we take for granted, a lot of us, I guess, in the first world countries take for granted is clean air. Well, I'm in LA. I don't know if I have clean air, but people can breathe. That is, there is a scarcity of resources in the future of the fix. Now, what's really cool about this movie is Grace Van Dien is a very interesting protagonist. She's not completely likable as a person, but because of the breakneck pace of the movie, you're following her journey as she's trying, she she takes a drug thinking it'll get her high or something. And this drug changes her, transforms her into, I'm not going to give it away, but her body shifts. She suddenly becomes it almost feels like Eric, co-host Eric Holmes over at Cinematics was saying it's sort of like a Marvel origin story, but I'm not going to say what happens to her character, but she undergoes some kind of transfer, metamorphosis, a sort of Kafka-esque, sort of comic book-esque as well. So you will get to see that's part of the joy of is learning what happens to Grace's character, how she transforms into possibly, is it another being? Is it something else? I'm not going to say. You'll figure that out yourself. While she's going through all the stuff, she needs to find some kind of antidote to cure her situation. Unfortunately, there is a corrupt person who is after her and wants to probably capture her and test her because this antidote or this whatever potion, I don't know, whatever, this liquid thing is not, hasn't been tested on humans. And she is, I guess, test case number, test case A, this model played by Grace Van Dien. So she is wanted by this antagonist. He's very corrupt. And also there are people who are chasing her too. And you you don't know what their motivations are. And she's just either a late teen or someone in her early 20s. She's just trying to figure things out. So she's, not only is she under stress, this new anti, this new fix that she just drank is not helping her with her just, I'm, I was going to say high blood pressure, but she is under a lot of pressure. So this movie, she's very nervous throughout the narrative while all this stuff is going around her. I really enjoyed what Kelsey Egan did with the special effects and storyline. It moved at a breakneck pace. I should pull up how long this movie is. I think it's around 90 to 95 minutes. It's a very brisk film, and I really enjoyed it. I gave a full review on this week's Cinematics with Eric Holmes. Both of us recommend it. If you are listening to Find Your Film right now on a Thursday, you have a chance to pre-order it on Apple TV, and that will help the algorithm of the fix so I will leave a link for that where you can purchase it on app, pre-order it on Apple TV. And I am this is kind of why I'm releasing it on Thursday, November 21st, early afternoon. But I really enjoy the fix. Look, 
sci-fi thrillers this is not a hundred million or a 200 million dollar sci-fi thriller but there's a lot of ingenuity behind it i really enjoyed the action and ultimately the characters not going to say what happens at the ending at the end and i wish i actually asked kelsey egan about this but it's really interesting that this story could become a sequel and i would watch that sequel i would watch the fix too okay because i really enjoyed the world that kelsey egan she also wrote this built really enjoy this movie as for the interview itself with kelsey at my advanced age i'm using i'm you know at 53 i'm trying to learn as much as possible before i know every day is not guaranteed but i've taken so much advantage and so much privilege to actually be on this earth for 53 years it's time i start learning things and doing other things instead of watch movies. That's why in the middle of the, of the interview, I asked her how yoga has shaped her life. And maybe, who knows, maybe one of these days I will try yoga myself, specifically power yoga. I need to sweat out all of my, not just toxins, but just, well, that's TMI. I just need to be in better shape. So she gives some really great insights on yoga. Also, she talks about her journey through in South Africa when she, I think, moved there or went on vacation there. Not vacation, she went on some kind of working journey there, start, like 2006 or 2007-ish. She clears it up in the interview, but she talks about how, her time as a filmmaker in South South Africa, okay? And then that said, she believes in a borderless way of working, and she got this visa. I forgot what the name of the visa is. I Googled it, and it's a really good UK global visa or something. And she talks about getting that and how it helps her as a filmmaker to work, I'm assuming in the UK as well as South Africa and maybe other places, that'd be great if it really, really expands her working opportunities. But she's got to get more opportunities after people watch The Fix. I haven't seen her previous film, Glass House. Definitely want to check that out. Here is my interview with Kelsey Egan. Hope you enjoy it. Some insights on yoga, South Africa. Also, if you are a wannabe screenwriter or a screenwriter or writer, she gives some really good insights on how She's not, it's good insights, but also very real insights on her life as a screenwriter and how she approaches her work while also doing other jobs, doing other things to make ends meet. So it's a really good interview with Kelsey. It's a, hope you enjoy it. And then after I'm done with Kelsey, I'll do my intro with Ryan Kruger. Oh, also wanted to mention, this is a very interesting coincidence. Ryan Kruger is an actor in The Fix. And because I'm a horrible journalist, I did not ask Kelsey Egan about working with Ryan Kruger. And I did not ask Ryan Kruger about working on The Fix. So that's my fault. But just know that this Find Your Film episode is pretty interesting because both of them, South Africa, films in South Africa. Okay, I, I, I haven't really directed, I mean, not directed, interviewed filmmakers from South Africa other than Kruger several years ago. I interviewed Ryan Kruger back in 2021 for Fried Berry. But now for this episode of Find Your Film, South African filmmaker, Kelsey Egan, though she's probably going to be working other places, but she's been in South Af Africa for quite a while, and I'm assuming that's her home, and then Ryan Kruger. So, and they work together. It's just a very interesting coincidence for this episode of Find Your Film. I'm going to shut up for about 20 some odd minutes as you listen to Kelsey Egan wax poetic on filmmaking, yoga, the fix, and I will be quiet now. All right. Enjoy the Kelsey Egan interview and tell me what you think of the fix. Okay, so I'm here with Kelsey Egan, the writer, director, producer. What else for the fix, Kelsey? That seems like a 48 hour in, in 24 hour kind of job. What other credits should I am I missing out on? Let's please not add the others. <laughs> please not add the You can find them snuck into the credits, but we, we don't like to talk about it. That, okay, well, I do want to talk about within the last several years, you've written several screenplays. I'm sure those screenplays might have been even written maybe even years before, three years ago, but. What is your usual workflow as far as how you approach a screenplay? Do you have a workflow in the morning or is it more filmmaking dependent, meaning you, you know you want to do this movie, so then you start writing towards that? Great question. So I, I always think there's the fantasy workflow and then there's reality. <laughs> so the fantasy workflow, which I've only been able to do like once or twice in my entire life, and I always feel so lucky when it happens, is that a... a amazing concept that I want to develop. I partner with like the best possible producing team for that concept or producer. And we we actually managed to get some development funding or there's a shopping agreement or something where I, there's actually financing for me to write the script based on the treatment that I've already pitched and sold, sold the idea 
for. And then that I can just actually afford to live and focus 100% of my energy on just writing the script. It's amazing. <laughs> you just do much, much better work that way. Um, and, it, and it's much more efficient and it's faster. And um, when I've been able to do that, and I know I, I basically have every, I'm, I'm a planner and I love Save the Cat. So I do structure everything. We always know where we're going. I have a scene breakdown that's approved in advance because I like everyone I'm working with to weigh in and it's a very collaborative process and you get all the notes at every stage. So by the time you're actually writing the script or writing the dialogue, for example, fleshing out your scene breakdown, you already know where you're going and everyone's making the same movie. Because there's nothing worse than you think you're making the same movie and then you surprise people with something else, right? So so I, I definitely have a plan, but then I have a page count that I make every day and I can just completely focus on that and kind of like have a, a, a very balanced, healthy life. And this is the dream. Does it often happen like that? No. A lot of the times I'm working another job to support myself and I'm squeezing in the writing whenever I can and in between um, and I don't have much of a balanced life and me wanting to create is means not having hobbies or doing other things because I'm squeezing it in around making a living. That's amazing. When you squeeze it in, because so many people try to climb up that mountain and a lot of us don't get there. How are you able to get there with, because really you've completed your goals. If you look far and you look at your film credits, but you were saying that you've only had that, that fantasy once or twice, but a lot of times it's inefficient. Work-life balance is not really balanced. How were you able to get to that mountain when you're trying to squeeze it in and you could easily give up and just lay your head down on the pillow and rest? I ask myself that every day. Sometimes I lay down on the pillow and I stare at the ceiling and disassociate. And no, I you you always hope that it will get easier and you always hope that that you could just get really grateful when the good opportunities come in. Um, but as you know, the industry has not gotten easy over the years. We've sort of seen a bit of an implosion and uh, a, a dramatic change and shift over the last decade. Um, traditional distribution models don't really exist anymore. The streamers have revolutionized the industry in some ways, very exciting, but in other ways, uh, sort of really shook stuff up. But then if they don't close the gap of traditional distribution routes, then you kind of are left hanging. So a lot of finance models don't work the way they used to. So I think, you know, when and also audiences are just flooded with content, right? And and have much shorter attention spans. So I think traditional cinema or is traditionally what we saw cinema to be in the immense outlet and and passionate and that it was it's all sort of there's a lot of people right now so i don't know how things are gonna land so i yeah i'm continually grateful for any opportunity well maybe i'm overshooting but is that why with whatever budget you have to you had to work with for the fix that you it seems visually you did not take the easy way out you wanted to actually put as much cinema as possible and stretch that dollar you know i, I don't want to talk too much about grace's character but when she, when she takes that fix, you could have actually made the transformation a lot more subtle and working within the budget, but you decided to actually just go for it. Is that one of the reasons why? Because you wanted to be ambitious as opposed to say, oh, well, well I only have this, so I'll just do this. Yeah, no, I, I think the first thing you said nailed it. I aspired to create cinema in the way that I was arrested as a child watching cinema, right? And, and to take people on a, on a real journey. And that's um, hugely exciting to me and something I'm very passionate about. Um, but at the same time, the irony is we did do a huge amount of concessions and creative problem solving with our resources because we didn't have any. Uh, well, we did, but, you know, it was it was very ambitious for the budget. So, for example, with uh, with. Grace's character and that transformation you see occur, you'll notice that it has many different looks over many different stages and she's often covering herself up and you only see certain things at certain times as the transformation advances. There's a reason, well, besides it just being more natural, more believable if you're actually having that happen to you without giving too much away, but there's a reason that we broke it up into stages and only revealed the final look. Late, like in the very final act of the film, you know, um, and that was all budget considerations and trying to be very smart and clever with our reveals to maximize our dollar. Now, with a fixer is a really interesting line that I think is pretty resonant. I, I don't know who says it or where, where it pops up, but just really popped to me. It said, change or die. And one of those things, you can, one can apply that to their own life. And did you apply that to your own life as well? Because your path to becoming a filmmaker is... You didn't go, you didn't study, you weren't one of these New York film, New York City film students or filmmakers or here in the industry town of Los Angeles. You've made your own community and industry town. 
over in South Africa. Can you just talk about that, in my opinion, very gutsy change? Or was it maybe not as gutsy as I'm thinking, because maybe you saw some kind of calling back in, I don't know, 08 or 09, where you decided to start your journey there? Yeah, no, I I first came to South Africa in 2007. Actually, no, I'm lying, 2006. So I just graduated from college and I wanted to say goodbye to what I always thought I wanted to do, which was large predator behavioral research, because I studied neuroscience and behavior and theater. And when I was in school, I realized that um, I was happiest when I was doing creative collaborations and that that was the path I wanted to pursue. But I still had this like deep love for animal conservation and research. So there were some exceptional programs in South Africa. And I went and I had the most magical couple of months I'd saved up over my four years in, in college to be able to do that. And while I was sort of traveling around the country, I just fell in love with it absolutely fell in love with it and then realized there was an industry there and realized that there was some very exciting uh, service industry opportunities um, and that very big big productions um, from Hollywood and from Europe and UK were coming to shoot there and realized that that was an opportunity but also I think you know, I, I'd already been, you know, working in film a bit in New York, and I realized that to be the type of storyteller, to develop the type of voice I wanted to have, I felt it was really important that I get out of my bubble, which was a very specific bubble, and that to, like, just gain perspective, I needed to live and, and know what it felt like to be a fish out of water or to be other in a space and just, I guess, see if I could sink or swim. And of course, when you're young, you romanticize that a lot, and it seems like a big, grand adventure, so I just went for it. But you need that, right? That sort of you romanticized vision of what things could be to actually get to where you are right now. Don't do it. Yeah. <laughs> how hard it's going to be. You're not going to start. I, I really love how Ella, in, in a lot of the narrative, she's abrasive. And sometimes you might not be following her journey because she's not maybe not the best friend or the best lover or girlfriend, but she's going through things and you understand. You as a writer could have made her likable from the jump and make her more populist and you decided not to can you talk to us about on that writing angle that that approach which i thought was pretty refreshing oh i'm so glad um that you liked that we had a lot of conversations about that and i just feel it's more authentic it's more real and i'm very interested in like three-dimensionality of people and we all have our flaws we all have the areas in which we struggle or in the areas in which we don't cope with our own trauma very well and that we're just trying to make life work and, and make us work, right? And I think that delving into the, the harsher realities of that and not just putting sort of a glossy spin on everything is is more authentic to real life and the type of content that interests me more. Yeah, I, I was wa watching some of your past interviews and you were talking about the stress that comes from being a filmmaker and how possibly yoga really helps you center? I mean, I, I know it's, you're not, we're not going to be here for an hour talking about the ins and outs of yoga, but how has that enhanced your life? And does it, I've never done it and maybe I am in the, oh, yeah, in the wrong for not doing it. So what is what would your, your advice be for people who are trying to start that journey and what, how has it really enhanced your life in, I guess, in broad strokes? Well, so guilty confession, um, or not even guilty, but like it may be helpful to hear. I hated yoga for years. Like before I actively practice yoga, I was like, absolutely not. Like I cannot think of anything worse than sitting still in this room and like holding poses and around all these strangers. Like I, I found it really claustrophobic and really oppressive and didn't really get it and didn't really see that it would help my fitness. And wow, was I wrong. I just got lucky enough to go to some heated yoga classes at a wonderful studio called Yoga Life in Cape Town, which is just my sanctuary. And they have a very specific um, practice of very intense power yoga. So heated, you're like drenched in sweat. It feels like a detox, but going through a really an intensive flow vinyasa practice. And I, the, the first like two or three classes were very uncomfortable. And I had to like sit in that discomfort and work through it. And after that, I was completely hooked. And every time I'm going through it's just particularly difficult period in my life and feel like everything is falling apart around me. Yoga is what I always return to to ground. And also in my everyday life, even when things are going well, it's my opportunity to check in with myself and truly see how I'm doing, how my body is doing, how I'm doing. But also I'm a thinker and I think I'm always overthinking everything and I'm always multiple chess moves in many different directions with many different projects. So when I'm do practicing yoga and being guided through a class, it's one of my few opportunities to just exist fully in the now or just let my mind drift while being so in tune to listening to my body. And I think in that sense, it's very meditative for me. But 
I will say I'm not there for the Zen. I'm there for, for the fitness component alongside the being present because I want to feel like my body has worked and moved and it gives a lot of practical body weight resistance training, balance, flexibility, all massive and things very, very lacking in a lot of fitness regimes. So that's my punch for yoga. <laughs> and I, will- I need intense yoga. It can't just be like casual, not not particular like you want to be working cardio yeah just jump right in right feel hard it should feel very hard yeah okay so look after watching and enjoying the fix i really want to see glass house so just from the i guess big picture what's it been like to sort of collaborate and nurture the talents of someone like grace and then with glass house you have jessica alexander the top build on that that must mean a lot to you as a collaborator see their artistry flourish under, I guess, sort of your projects and then seeing them grow post your projects. Yes, you're so proud. But also it's 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 a gift, right? Like, I think there's nothing that brings me more gratification, I guess, weirdly, than to be able to bring together these exceptional talents and give them a platform to shine. And also work with them in building and developing these characters and and emoting, right? And finding the the points where we can really, I, I guess, express something powerful or impactful or meaningful that might resonate with other people as much as it resonates with us. But when I think the greatest gift any cast member can give you is trust. And I, I mean, I, I, I have... Um, a very funny story. I adore Jess. And I actually found her way back before she'd done Little Mermaid or any of the major credits she has now. And um, just had a feeling about her and she taped and I was blown away. Um, and, and we've, you know, stayed in touch since. And she was very funny with Glass House because she liked to tease me about, because I have a lot of attention to detail and I'll be very specific about things. So she liked to tease me about that, which was very sweet. Because she was, she was always, she's such a good listener and would always be so on it. But um, she's also a has a like a wonderful sense of fun um, and then after when glass house was re- released we had like a catch-up and she was like oh my word i had flashbacks and visions of every scene where you were so detailed and then i saw on the screen why you did that because at the time i just trusted you but i was like oh here we go like okay i gotta do like do all this very specific stuff but i trusted you and then i got to watch it play out and understand why you were being so detailed with that choice and so specific was was like damn and that was really cool to hear you i'm sure you're gonna be working with her after that comment and just collaboration i'm sure you want to work with her down the road in in some of your projects as well so hope to yeah yeah so my, my final question is just now i almost 20 years living in south africa do you feel the pull to go back to the states or is this your home is this in that initial thing that brought you there how has it changed over the years because now you're experienced and you're living there i don't like borders very much i think um borders is a way of of, is, is another form of classism societal social classism so um i'm i having access to multiple geographies is really important to me personally and i feel very privileged it's a it's a massive privilege to be able to to do that and sort of feel like you belong to multiple places so south africa is definitely home in that it will always have my heart and that i have spent pretty much my entire adult life there but with that said i because of my aversion to borders and i think i I never want to feel like i'm not being completely open to whatever opportunity the world gives me for the right project or the right person i would travel or base myself somewhere else for a while Um, and i was saying that i just got the uk global talent visa which i'm really grateful for because it means that i am more hireable and i think always in life i just want to be able to be easier to hire be a be a a, be a like sort of tick all the boxes be like oh great like we can totally consider for this because it's such a competitive um industry um so and and also going back to borders i like to joke i like i want to have as many passports as possible that's amazing and just very quickly on on that is a lot of people they want to maybe do well in the careers and make their money and then just find their little corner of the world and just shelter themselves i can't wait to see glass house by the way shelter themselves out from the outside and not bring anyone in you're on the flip side and you're all about opening your life to so many different possibilities where did that come from did maybe the way you were brought up or was that something that you leaned into and you learned during your progression because that's very interesting growing up i had a wonderful supportive family but i never really felt at home where i 
in like the, I don't know, at, at home in my hometown, I so to speak, even though I had wonderful friends and wonderful family, never felt like that was where I was supposed to spend my life. I don't know where that instinct came from. But I will say that something that's very important to my family and something that was instilled in me very young was an appreciation for the arts, patronship of the arts, and reading. And I think I read so much science fiction and so much fantasy and so many of the classics and so many, you know, like historical dramas and all this content that just encouraged me to look outwards and painted a picture that there was all of these things to experience in the lands and multiple lands that I think maybe that fostered the desire to experience as much as possible. Great. Thank you so much for your time. And are there some more stories in your desk drawer for you to shoot? Are you still in development of a lot of stuff? There are. I'm developing a number of different projects at the moment, and I would love nothing more than to find the right partners for them and focus on writing the scripts and to hopefully enter production. I have a number of different things in different stages. Kelsey, thank you so much for your time. Really enjoy the fix. Looking forward to Glass House. And the next time we, we speak... We will talk yoga with some experience too. Okay, I will make it hard. This time. Okay, no, I love try. that. And I'd love to just, if, if if you don't mind, just get a quick little punt in. Indie film is has never been easy, but in this day and age, it's it it seems like it's up against more and more struggles for any any independent filmmaker to have a chance. And on that note, we have been informed, and and it, they've explained it to us very nicely by our distributor that Apple TV pre-orders make a massive difference and how a indie film is sort of perceived. So essentially, if we get enough pre-orders on Apple TV, not only will we get featured a more prominent placement in the Apple and iTunes storefront, which is huge because it like shows people the film exists. Also, it it, it um, helps our distributor advocate to get a better deal on one of the streamers. So if anyone is interested in the film or enjoy this interview and will be willing to do a pre-order on Apple TV of the film, I'd be so exceptionally grateful. I want to support indie film and support The Fix. I really enjoyed it. And Apple TV. Sounds good. Awesome. Thank you so much. I appreciate thank, it. Thank you so much, Kelsey. Take care. All right. I'm back. I told Eric Holmes, I think I said it's on Cinematics this week. Out of all the film, I interview a lot of filmmakers. And this is the second time I've been interviewed Ryan Kruger. I was a huge fan of Fried Berry. If you haven't seen it, go go see it. It's very, very good. And it's the lead actor from Fried Berry. It's Gary something. This time I'm actually going to use my computer. He stars in Street Trash as well. So if you are a fan of Fried Berry, and he's Gary something, I'm, it's my bad on this. But it's great to see that sort of continuance. Gary Green. Gary Green was the lead in Fried Berry, and he is one of the characters in the new movie Street Trash. It is a new movie, but it is also could be considered a remake or maybe a follow-up to the original movie Street Trash, which I have not seen as of yet. Kruger mentions in the interview how he was a fan of the original and how he brought his own spin to this either remake or sequel. However, supposedly people who've seen Street Trash will consider Ryan Kruger's Street Trash as a follow-up sequel. People who are just not familiar with the original, people like me, probably will look at Street Trash as a standalone film. And if if you are so inclined and are a fan of Kruger's Street Trash, there's a good chance I'm sure you're going to go back and check out the original and compare the two. Eric Holmes had this viewing piece of advice saying that people should watch the original Street Trash if they're if they are a fan of Fried Berry and Ryan Kruger. And then after watching the original, go check out Ryan Kruger's Street Trash. Now, this movie, it centers on, quote, I'm reading from IMDb, by the way, an alien takes, oh, that's not fried, that's fried berry, my fault. So you know what I'm going to actually talk about? I'm not going to go to IMDb. I'm going to give my review, my not my review, my plot summary of Street Trash. It just centers on a group of misfits. They're homeless people. They're living in, I'm assuming, South Africa in the possibly not so distant future. And what happens is they are going to be eradicated, eradicated by the evil hand of the government or corrupt people. Someone has actually come up with a serum or it, you know, what's interesting is the fix that has sort of a liquid thing. Yeah, this has a lot of liquid in it because the first liquid is this thing that is injected into their system, this formula or whatnot. And when it's in their system, they melt. This movie, Street Trash, is considered a, quote, melt movie. So you will see several people in this movie 
their bodies and face will melt. And when they melt, they will melt not in just the color red of blood, it will melt in different gooey, rainbowy colored blood, which for some reason, Eric Holmes was grossed out by it. I thought it was cool to watch all these different colors come out of people. I know that sounds horrible, but the movie is shot on 35 millimeter. It looks beautiful. It looks like a movie that you would see from the 80s and early 90s. It has that really good grain to it, but it's not too hip for its own good. It just tells a really great story about here. Quote, a group of homeless misfits must fight for survival when they discover a plot to exterminate every homeless person in the city. There's humor. There's a ton of heart in the movie. You get to these homeless, quote, homeless misfits. You get to really know them. There's maybe about four, five or six of them you get to know on a pretty good basis, mainly three of them. And one of them is played by Donna Cormac Thompson. She plays a woman who's during the beginning of the movie, she's saved by a couple of these misfits. And she event she eventually joins a group and becomes friends with them. The ensemble includes Sean Cameron Michael. He's the main person. He plays Ronald. And also, let me see, Joe Vaz as chef. Some really good stuff. It, it's a great hybrid of comedy, that melt movie, horror thriller. And it's also social commentary on what do we, what if you're a rich person, do you help your fellow man? Or do you give them a just do you inject or force a liquid onto them that will make them melt? What kind of horrible or good person are you? You will. It may make you look at yourself in the mirror. The main person in Street Trash, the main villain, he's pretty arrogant and condescending and obviously very violent. Reminded me a little bit of Donald Trump. Maybe the lead guy, the lead bad guy was trying to Summon him? I did not ask Ryan Kruger about that in the interview, but it's interesting. I, it, was, it was just maybe my little guess. And by the way, that is no knock on Trump. I'm not going to mention whether what side of the fence I lean on. It, was just, it just reminded me of Trump, the bad guy in street trash. Okay, so as far as the interview with Ryan Kruger goes, uh, I'm trying to recall. Oh, yes, 35 millimeter film. Okay, if you love conversations about shooting on film and its advantages versus dis disadvantages of shooting on digital. You got that for about four to five minutes in this interview. So it's a, a really good chat with Kruger about that process. And then he just, yeah, that's the one that really stood out as far as this movie goes. And he also talks about just being ambitious as a filmmaker and just going for it. What's interesting is both Ryan Kruger and Kelsey Egan, they're, they both work with a certain budget and they both try to stretch the dollar in a cinematic fashion to make their movies the best. Both of them are pretty much indie films. It's great that they're getting its share of distribution here stateside. And I would love to see more budgets for their movies, even if they don't get that budget that they want. I'm, I'm assuming both of them are crafty and ingenious enough to make some really interesting narratives with their work. Egan, I've only seen The Fix, and I did enjoy that. I'm going to go back and check out Glass House. Kruger, huge, huge fan of fried berry. I should have bought, I don't know why I did not buy any kind of fried berry shirt. If there is some street trash merch, I will purchase that because I love this film as well. So who knows? Maybe if if crypto continues to, cryptocurrency continues to go up and I make a couple of bucks, I'll, I'll, I'll pony up some money to buy a street trash shirt. But Anyways, here is my interview with Ryan Kruger. Again, Street Trash in theaters, not in theaters, my bad. Street Trash on digital and on screen box starting Friday, November 22nd. And here is my interview with Ryan Kruger. Ryan, pleasure to interview you again. Yeah, and I was just going to say, I remember you. Yeah. How's it going, man? Great, great, to, great to see you again. Yeah, it's going, it's going good. So I'm here with Ryan Kruger, filmmaker behind Street Trash, huge fan of Fried Berry. Rewind three years ago, I listened to the interview and you were mentioning about imagery with digital, so many advantages, but the image itself is just so crisp and clean that when you're on your iPad or, or entertainment system, every visual looks the same uh, and it looks clean and beautiful. Can you just talk about the advantage and necessities i feel if you're a cinephile to shoot on 35 yeah i mean listen i think i, I i've shot on film 
over 10 years ago doing two two short films not even having a, a monitor so you don't, you don't know what they're getting I think with this film when I was chatting to the producers they said to me do you want to shoot 35 and obviously straight away I was like oh my god that, that, yeah yeah, yeah that, this will be amazing it's like do you want to shoot on film and I was like yeah we've got to shoot 35 and they were like okay and I'm like and, and then the more I thought about it after that conversation the more I was like maybe I should just shoot digital like obviously I want to shoot 35 but there's risks there's, this is why producers probably don't like film because, you know, you could lose the fucking scene uh, and then it's gone and you've just paid for all this stuff and you've got to redo it. And, you know, there is there is those risks with money and budgets of shooting on film, you know. So the close I got, I was I was like, oh, maybe we should just have a digital camera on the side. And I'm like, no, you can't do that. And I'm like, all right, all right, all right. And then obviously it's all about getting the right crew, getting the right loader, getting the right DP, getting the right people that works on film. And the process was, you know, you've got, you know, we were shooting three or four days. Then we send the the, the film cans to England. It gets developed and then it digitally gets sent back. And only then we were like, whoa, okay, this is what we're getting. So, so playback you know, is digital, but it's not, the, you know, it's not exactly what you're seeing. And, you know, it's not going to look the same. So it's only when I got back the footage, I was like, oh, this is cool. Okay, we're doing something right. Okay, this is going to be great. But what was great about shooting on film was the discipline with people. So when you're shooting digital, you know, people make people make noises and people do this. And, it, you know, people say, shh, shh, quiet, quiet, we're going for a take. This, there was that, there was that very strictness and very, a lot of respect just for filming because they know this costs money every time that thing goes around it's you know it's it it costs money so there was a lot of discipline and it, it was it, it was nowhere near as hard as i thought it would be to shoot on film we had all the right people they were great and uh, the discipline was there and it, yeah it was it just ran really smooth and a lot of the melt scenes we had two cameras i think it was just the first week was the most I was the most nervous because I didn't know what I was getting. But what I noticed when you see when, when you're watching that monitor and you're shooting a daytime scene, you can you can see you can clearly see everything. But it's still like bad quality, or like the monitor. It's still like you're still watching this bad quality. But at least it's daytime and you can actually see what's going on. When you shoot at night, you can't see anything on that on that monitor. Like you're looking at it and you're going. Is his eye line correct? And what you can't see the details in the background. It's very hard to see what you get. And that's what made me remember when I was a kid and I would notice like mistakes in like 80s or early 90s movies. I'm like, how did they not see this? How did they not see that? And then what I realized while I was shooting, I'm like, and what when I got the footage back and I was like, this is why there were so many mistakes because they would shoot the movie and then it would they would either watch the dailies the same day, you know, what they shot or or they couldn't go back and they couldn't have the budget. And then there was those mistakes in the background and it was too late. So I, I really, I, 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 like I found that so fascinating because you, if it's nighttime, there's so much that you can't see on the monitor. So I, 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 I really thought that was interesting. Like while, while we were shooting that and, and seeing that. Ryan, obviously different strokes for different folks, but since you're in the know, when you see other filmmakers say, well, you know, there's nothing against digital, but they'll say, okay, well, with digital and technology, now you can almost get close to that film grain. When you hear that, someone like me saying, "Okay, I, I'm going to lap that up because they, they're in the know," but you're the you're the person who's actually in the weeds. How do you feel when you hear that comment that maybe digital can almost replicate that film grain and that? It's, yeah, it's it, 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 it's got a lot. It's a, it's a lot better than it used to be. Definitely, okay. what, what what we can uh, you know add in grain, add in all these things. You know, some people when they try replicate replicate like an eighties movie, it's like it's got too many scratches. They're doing all this. It's like it didn't look like that. It's just over over. You know, it's just over over done, and then. But now you do see people, and they they, they can make it look pretty from coolness. But there's nothing like film. There's nothing. There's not. It's so beautiful and it's so like raw, and it's just there. And it's you. You can't replicate that completely. Like you know, I I can watch certain footage. I'm like, okay, this is definitely shot probably on this camera or this camera. And it's like with film, it's just it's beautiful and it's just you know it's you can't you can't replicate that and it's and it's something very special and it, again it's it's one of those things where why don't we shoot more on on film but again it's a money thing it's a it's a money thing it's a time thing you can see what you when it's digital you can see it, it, digital is a luxury 
That's what it is. Digital is literally a luxury of let's do it again, let's do it again, let's do it again, let's do it again. I don't like this. We can change this. We can add this. We can change this. And in film, is it's it's that's what it is. It's like you're shooting, and it's it's it it just has all those different textures. Like I I hate that clean clean digital look, and it's just it doesn't. It's it's like the settings on people with the the TVs now. It's that there's that certain look, and I'm like, this looks like a theater play. It doesn't look like a movie. It's you can see the makeup on the skin, and uh, like it's like like films weren't designed. It's actually making DPs work look or lighting look when it's wow. it's not made be on that TV. It's made to look like a film. It's like when you're watching TV and you turn over and you see a reality re- reality show, you can see that it's a reality show. Or you can see that it's a soap that you're watching. Like, you know what I mean? You can tell straight away, like the human eye go, oh, okay, this looks cheap. Or this looks like a reality show. This looks like a film. You know? Yeah. And I think that's... I haven't... That's- this, this is probably the first Melt movie I've seen and I really enjoyed it. I'm excited. How excited are you to know that people will see Street Trash, really enjoy it, and then maybe they can go back to the original is that also another cool part of you as a filmmaker to introduce people to that original as well while also yeah. praising your singular vision to this one as well too yeah, yeah. I, listen I, I growing up in the 80s and early 90s i was a fan of all these 80s films i was a fan of street trash so when i got the opportunity to do street trash i didn't want to change you know i, I didn't i didn't want to copy I didn't want to copy the original at all. I wanted to come up with a new idea. I wanted to come up that it's actually a sequel. So for a new audience, it can be a standalone film. But for the fans and people like me, it's like, you know, I play homage and nods to the original film, you know? So it's like, you know, I I wanted the film, like the biggest thing I wanted to take from the original was, you know, the fluorescent blood, you know, the the multicolored blood and and gore. You know, that's obviously a very important thing. And then for me, I wanted a stronger narrative uh, story and i wanted a strong cast you know and uh, characters which is in any film that anybody should do uh, characters are important and for me you know i love uh, characters and i think this film was the, was a perfect type of film to introduce all these mad crazy funny characters you know yeah they're mad crazy and funny but also there's i mean not you know not, yeah there's a lot of heart and there's a lot of humanity to it as well is that another reason that propelled you to actually make street trash because it's not a preachy film but it really shows it gives a depth of feeling to the characters yeah listen i think in the genre scene there's a there's a lot of films that get made that's just pure gore that people find fun and stuff like that but then when it comes to story it's when it comes to characters it so for me, it's like, and this is why I say any film that anybody should make, you got to have those, you got to have like strong characters. You got to have cool characters that you can either relate to or go on this journey with. So it's, you know, that's important. It should be important for any movie that you, that you make that you have this. So yeah, yeah, you got you to gotta have a strong story and you got to have strong characters. And, you know, people are going to sit there and watch it. You don't want people to watch it and go, oh, the goal was great, but the story was crap. Or, the, you know, the the uh, the, the goal was, uh, the, or the goal was terrible and there was no story and the characters were, you know what I mean? So you got you to gotta, you gotta tick those boxes. You got to tick those boxes if you want to win over the audience. You got to tick those boxes if you want the original fans to also love uh, this film. And as original fan, you know, I kind of know what I want to see as original fan and play homage to to the original you know i don't know how much of a budget you had to work with for street trash but i mean you you didn't make it it seemed to me that you don't make it really you made it really hard on yourself because there's a great opening sequence where it's a chase sequence how hard was that to shoot and then that third act without giving too much away that's like reminding me of those escape films uh, carpenter stuff just all that stuff at the end it's very elaborately done you could have gone easier on yourself but you pushed it to the limit. Is that something that you've always wanted to do as a filmmaker? I I think as a filmmaker, you got to push it. It doesn't matter what budget you get. It really doesn't matter what budget you get. There is definitely tricks of the trade that you can pull a stuff off for cheaper. We did have a a decent budget, but uh, again, uh, I'm not going to say what budget we had, but at the same time, you know, as a filmmaker, you got to push things. You got to push things because, you you know, you want to keep working in the industry. You want to, you, you, you know, it doesn't matter what the budget is that you, but you got to stretch yourself and, and push that for, uh, to show what you can pull off for that type of budget. And, uh, you know, if you give me more budget, I'll still be stretching it no matter what it is. Even if it's triple budget, I'm still going to be stretching it to make a bigger, better movie 
and trying to pull off stuff. And that's why, you know, I would love to make a film in the States, but, you know, making a film here, I have my connections and I have my, what do you call it? The, uh, the help phone call where you can pick it up and go, I need this. You know, I have that, you know, have those lifelines that I, that I can have here with the people that I've built, you know, a, you know, 15, 17 year, you know, relationship with. So, uh, you know, I can, I, I definitely, if I made this film in the States, I couldn't have, I couldn't have made it as good as what I've made it here. You know? Wow. Well, so, so it's been three years. What's the last three years been like for you? Because thanks to Fried Berry, I'm assuming you've just carved out your own community of fans of the film and they're so excited to see this. And has it been great to actually have that community to support your work as well? Yeah. Or am I overthinking that? Yeah. You, know, fr- you know, after Fried Barry and during when Fried Barry came out, I mean, there's so many hardcore fans with Fried Barry and there's, it's, it's you know, I, you know, every now and then, and then I, you know, I go, I go on Twitter and I go on this and just to check, you know, who's 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 speaking about Fry Barry. And you know what? There's not one month that goes by that somebody is not talking about Fry Barry, is not sharing it with somebody, is not talking about it. So those, yeah, there's a lot of hardcore fans for, for Fry Barry, and there's a lot of people that's super excited about this film because of Fry Barry. And there's a lot of uh, you know original fans of Street Trash that want to check it out. That's uh, you know on the fence a bit. There's a lot of uh, fans that uh, of the original Street Trash that have seen it and they're like, oh, this is great. It's so cool that it's a sequel. It's so cool that you give the nods to the film. You're like, I was so worried in case it was going to be this and this. I've had people that love the original but like this one more, and I'm like, oh my god, that's amazing as well. So, but like I said, I didn't want to take anything from. Uh, you know, the the original, I'm a fan of the original. I don't want to change that. I didn't want to replicate that. I wanted to do my own thing. I wanted to build my own world. And yeah. Well, yeah. not to get too overly sentimental, but will it be a sad day when you make, when you direct a film and Gary's not in it? Will that ever happen? Uh, I think Gary will more, be more sad than me. But Gary, uh, there'll always, uh, Gary will, the, there'll always be a space for for Gary in any film that I do, whether it's a bigger part or a smaller part, there, there'll always be a room for that guy. He's He's a very good friend of mine. Yeah, we have a we have a great friendship. We love working together, and I think I'm very good at, at casting Gary to make him look bigger and better. And you know, I, it's all about casting. You know, it's all about people. It's all about you know, uh, you know. We spoke about Fry Barry last time and Gary's background. You know, it's all about getting the right person. Even with other act, you know, other actors and stuff. You know, it's about putting them in the right part where they're going to shine. And and that's the thing. So I, I I pick my parts very well that I know that Gary will shine in, and it takes a lot to work with them to get exactly what I want but we get there in the end and we have we both have respect for each other and we we both admire each other's uh, work and uh, like I love working with Gary and uh, you know there's there's something I'm working with uh, Gary with right now as well so it's like uh, yeah so they'll always they'll, yeah we'll always work together there'll always be something there for them, you know right my final question is last time we talked you mentioned your love for Christine just wanted to know for our listeners can you give them Maybe a couple of movie picks that you would you would want us to see after watching Street Trash. After watching Street Trash, I mean, the, you know, there's a lot of references in in, in Street Trash uh, from like you know Escape from New York. I think go, you know, go check out Escape from New York. That's always like a classic a film that I always go back to. Go check out Warriors. I love Warriors. So a few references in that, and then yeah, man, just like any like cool eighties gore films and stuff like that. I mean, you can just Google it. There's like there's so many cool films you know from this time that uh, should get a lot more love now and need to get more love now. So we keep making these cool type of films so it doesn't disappear. It's cool to keep this prosthetics within film without mixing it with CGI and and really sitting with like really cool gore scenes that, uh, you know, that we love, that we enjoy. Ryan, were you as a teenager, were you watching the heck out of Walter Hill and John Carpenter films? Were, were, you, were you a teenager oh, yeah, watching VHS yeah, yeah. tapes or what? what? Yeah, like it's such a part of. I was just explaining uh, the other day. This these kids are today. They will not. We might, we might even spoke about this last time. I don't know. But it's like go into a video shop, man. Go into a video shop when you were a kid. Your mom stayed at home because she knew. Yeah, you know, you and your brother and your dad were, they were going to be in there for f-ing hours. You know, it's going to f-ing take hours. And and it wasn't even about reading the back of the video. It was like checking out the artwork, looking at this f-ing crazy f-ing artwork, and going, "Oh my god, oh, you know, let's watch that. Let's watch that." And it was such a big. Part of it, it, you know, it was a Friday or Saturday night. You know, you, your, mom, your dad's going to, you know, your mom and dad's going to get some, like, cool takeaway food that you don't normally have during the week. So it's a special, it's a Friday, or it's a Saturday. And then what's even better was when your dad said, all right, you can get two films. And then you were like, 
amazing. And then you and me and my brother would sit there and we would like, he would choose five and I would choose five and my dad would choose five. And then it's like, okay, well, let's rather watch this one than this one. And it would just go down and then we'll be three hours in the video shop. And then we go out and then we come out with three instead of two. And, <laughs> and that's, and that's what it was. And th- those moments growing up in a video shop, these kids don't know nothing today. Like, you know, going through Netflix and shit like that. Obviously you got some cool kids out there that are going to check the retro stuff and going back and looking at that stuff. But as a kid sitting in your room or with your friends on a weekend, watching these movies on your little TV, and all that there's, there's something special something special about passing that nightmare on Elm Street or or Jason or whatever just those VHS is going around oh you got to watch this and I want you know it, there's something special that's I think there's some of those moments are lost in time and it's it, it's sad and it's we've got to it's like that hard that hard media as well you know we, we you, you want the blu-ray you want the the dvd you know what you want those hard hard copies uh, in south africa it's p- completely gone it's completely gone i'm so Are you serious that. wow yeah. in america and england and europe i'm so happy that you know there's still a, like a, a lot of collectors and there is still places that sell it in south africa it's it's, gone. it's completely it disappeared like you know when england stopped Virgin and and HMV and all those went. You know there is those places that still sell stuff, but in South Africa it is it's gone. It's like it's part of the past. People, people when I when I speak to people about it, they're like, "What? Really? It's still people still collect stuff." And I'm like, "Yeah, it's it's just South Africa. It's like it's gone." You know? Yeah, you and I are so old. We never thought that Street Survivor or Escape from New York would ever be gone from any kind of shelf. And now it's it's yeah. buried under one big streamer, right? So. Yeah, no, exactly. And if you look at a lot of the uh, the streamers, they haven't, they've hardly got any. Well, they, in the 70s, they probably got none. 80s, they might have one or two, and that's it. Yeah. And that's why it's so important to, I mean, I, I even remember like when I first started in film school about like, 16 oh, 15 years ago sitting there and the lecturer talking about movies and uh he'd be like oh have you seen this and i'd be like yeah and i grew up in england so i think i got to see like more movies so i'd like put my hand up and then i'd look around and go how have you not seen this movie it's like what what, what made you want to become a filmmaker like cruel intentions or like what the f- made you want to do fucking movies you know so <laughs> you know it's all these movies that you should have been seen so it's yeah it's 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 it, the people that want to watch movies or or you know will go out there and go and go look for it you know uh, yeah. but it's just sad when you type in whether it's christopher walken or gene hackman or whatever and you go type that into netflix dude i tell you now not, nothing's gonna fucking come up you know yeah Great. yeah yeah so anyways man thank you so much for your time love your film and um, love your films and see you in a couple of years amazing thank you so much dude till the next time man totally. keep well man all right, guys, I'm back. Finally, just find your film. It's been very intermittent when I upload these interviews and whatnot, and that's my fault. I just have so much to do with cinematics and all these interviews. I need to be more organized, but the good thing is I got organized a little bit for this week, and I have these two really cool films to fix and Street Trash to offer for you guys, and hopefully you guys are a fan of both these movies. would love to hear. Look, if there's a way you can support indie film, Pre-order the fix, rent the fix, buy the fix on digital. Same thing with Street Trash. Pre-order it, buy it on digital, support indie filmmakers. These are very interesting directors who, I'll be honest, they they have a voice of their own. And I'm just really glad that I can spotlight movies that are not going to be on the top first page of Netflix. No disrespect. Or or what? The the front page of Netflix or or even Apple TV. Okay, so if you, if you want The Fix to be on that front page, please pre-order The Fix. But you know what I mean? Something that beats the algo and it's not going to be on your local theater. There are options out there. You don't have to. I mean, I eventually, I will see Wicked. But if you don't want to see Wicked or don't want to see Gladiator 2 this weekend, you have a shot. The Fix, right? Or Street Trash. Maybe you can get those a whirl. If you don't like them, you can message me. Don't message them. Be nice to the filmmakers. Message me and tell me I'm wrong, okay? Anyways, thanks again for supporting the cinematics podcast that I do with Bruce Perky and Eric Holmes, as well as this podcast, Find Your Film, which is an extension of cinematics. Take care, guys. Most importantly, would love to hear if you guys have some movie recommendations for me to watch because I'm trying to build some kind of archive for Find Your Films where we have actors and filmmakers recommending movies, talking about their favorite movies, and hopefully this cinematics universe will have some more recommendations for the listeners from the listeners 
So we want this to be a give and take thing as far as movie recommendations. Take care. I'm talking too much. The Fix and Street Trash. Talk to you guys soon next week. Bye.